Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are all here for the International Day of Permafrost. Our speakers are coming from around the world for the first session. We have Isabel gartner rar from the International Permafrost Association, Miriam Jackson from ECMOD, and Julia Boyke from T Mosaic. So we're going to start with Isabel. Thank you so much. It's amazing to see so many familiar faces and get to hopefully get to new, new faces. Um, a warm welcome personally from my side, but also um, on behalf of the International Permafrost Association to this event. Um, it's an honor to present um, the IPA here at this event. Um, and I entitled my short presentation, Successes and Challenges of the IPA, How to Best Serve the Community. So I'm really looking forward to also get feedback from your side. So the idea is to look shortly look back. So how did this develop? And um, of course, it's, it's super important um, to look into the future because what um, Stefan just mentioned, um, things were setting up a while ago and the landscape is changing quite a lot. So IPA was founded uh, in 1983 by the so-called Big Four, so Canada, the United States, Russia and China. Um, that had common ground in permafrost sci um, science and also engineering. And uh, the society was growing, got in connection with other uh, sizes, um, societies, became affiliated with the International Union of Geological Sciences and is nowadays also part of the International Science Council as an international organization representing the entire permafrost community on the international level. A very important part of, of this society is related to data on permafrost. So already in the uh, 1990s, IPA supported or started to develop um, the Global Terrestrial Network for Permafrost. I think you will hear more about this later on. Um, so develop this idea to build up a portal for data um, and make the, the monitoring of um, permafrost um, more available or the data more available to everyone so this, with this we have a strong link also to the climate community to gcos the global climate observing system and with this also to the wmo so we see a lot of acronyms big players um, but where are we where are the researchers in this context so uh, the ipa is built by a member countries you see here the list of, of countries um, that are building the council or a representative in the council. You see that not um, all of the countries with permafrost are represented here. So we are looking forward to enlarge this list of countries. Um, normally they're uh, formed by adhering, adhering bodies that are then the represent, national representatives um, within their countries. In addition, we have more than 1,000 individual members interested in the activities that are um, run by the IPA. There is an ex executive committee selected, elected, sorry, um, by council. Um, recent president is Christoph Byrne. You might all know him. Then Gonzalo, who's also um, giving a presentation today, and myself, we are the vice presidents, and we have Brett Fritz Nelson, Yuan Ming Lai, Michael Krautbrata, and Shesti Gisner from Norway um, as members. And we, together with the Secretariat, um, conduct the day-to-day -day activities of IPA, implement and communicate, uh, communicate the policies and views of the IPA, and you will hear more about this. Very important um, regarding our members is um, the huge group of young permafrost researchers. So there's a big group of um, bachelor, master students, PhDs that are interested in permafrost. Um, and they build a, a strong network with on the international level, but also on national levels with repeated meetings. And they are very, very active. Um, you will find the link to the homepage um, also on the uh, website of the IPA. 
And we have a very close uh, collaboration with the PIRN. So within um, the mission that we have to foster scientific exchange, for example, with our international and also the regional conferences that we support, we always have the link to the young permafrost um, people. We support them so they that as many of the young people as um, want to sh to go to these conferences are possible to do so. And also with fostering research and networking activities. So we have action groups, interest groups um, that are built for shorter time periods, um, work on a specific topic and get some, some funding um, from us. Also here we try to mainly support the young um, people. And the third uh, mission would be foster uh, education and outreach. And I will give a short glimpse into the, these three main pillars of our mission. So I mentioned already the international conferences. So the idea is really to bring the researchers together as you organize this event for today. Um, we did it since uh, many years on the international conferences, every four years. Unfortunately, um, due to the pandemic, there was a gap, there is a gap, there was a conference planned in China, which was then postponed for one year, and then finally we couldn't make it. So now with this, uh, after the pandemic situation, we really feel this gap that we didn't meet for a long time. And now we're looking forward, um, first of all, to meet in Spain for the regional conference, and then next year, uh, 2024 in June in Whitehorse, Canada for the next international conference. So this is really something which, go, which goes to our heart to bring people together in person, give them time for a week to meet and chat and start new collaborations. Then, as mentioned before, we have these action groups. So um, we support uh, groups um, with special topics that want to meet um, uh, and, and produce um, some kind of output. Uh, I can give you some examples. So, for example, there's a group on, on rock glaciers um, meeting regularly since uh, I think three years now, and they even managed to provide this new um, component of the ECV permafrost um, with the rock glacier velocities. Then we have more long standing groups. These are the interest groups, for example, on the carbon uh, cycle. And um, recently there was a call for new action groups and this is under evalu evaluation right now. Then education and outreach. Also there we had several products um, built by our partners um, um, for different, for um, smaller kids, for PhDs, also on different levels. And uh, we're looking forward to get this a little bit more reactivated in the next time. So one important point that I want to make here with this short presentation is that we see that there's, of course, an increasing interest in permafrost, especially yeah, with, the, uh, with the challenges that come with this uh, in, um, with the changing climate. There's also in parallel an increasing demand for information, data exchange among scientists, also from non-specialists non with the scientists, um, there's more exchange going on on the international level um, between organizations, but also for decision makers and the list would be much longer. So we see that there is this increasing demand and we also see that, um, to say it not too negative, so the IPA would need to do a better job in this. So there is this increasing demand and we are a bit, um, uh, how to say, yeah, we are a bit trapped in our little daily problems that we have with, with to run um, this society. So um, seems a bit ridiculous, but we in, in our um, business, when we meet, we have to talk about uh, bank account issues, um, that the, the website hosting and management needs some more support. And um, you see this list here so we have a changing office every couple of of years um these are the issues that we have and they are totally in opposite with what we want to do also what what the demand is also telling us 
So what we are planning now for the future is to be more stable with these um, management things, to run an international permafrost office, which can then build on a stable basis so that we from the XCOM um, representing you all can be more fit for the future to really run the scientific part of, of the community and get in, in better contact with you, uh, with the national levels and also with the international organizations. And therefore we are um, quite keen to hear your wishes, your concerns, and how we can um, do a better job on this international level, representing the permafrost community. Thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, so thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, good evening from Kathmandu. It's about 8.30 here. That means I'm not going to be around for most of this meeting. So if there's anything you want to follow up from my presentation, then please get in touch with me because I'll disappear in about two and a half hours. So I'm going to talk a little bit about permafrost research in the Hindu Kush Malai, but mainly about Isimod's role and how we're trying to support permafrost research. And I've also included Prashant Baral as co-author. You can see here from our um, photos, I'm the one posing and he's doing the work. So that's pretty typical. Um, ISIMOD, if you haven't heard of it, is an international center for integrated mountain development. It's based in Nepal, but we're actually working in eight different countries. So this is Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, Pakistan, Myanmar, Nepal, and Pakistan. Obviously for cryosphere work, we're mainly working in Nepal, um, Bhutan and Pakistan, and also having some interaction with um, India and China, but not really doing too much in Bangladesh and Myanmar. And at the moment in Afghanistan, our work's been a little bit curtailed there. And we're, we're quite different. We're, we're a knowledge center. We're not a university. We're not there just to do research and publish papers. That is part of our work, but it's more looking at the problems in the Hindu Kush Himalaya, and making sure that people outside of the regions are aware of the problems and also having people in the region to study the problems as well and find ways to adapt to, to different changes. Um, I normally hate it when someone shows the institute structure in a talk, but I'm going to do it. And this is because we've just changed our structure in a very big way. And it shows, it shows you where we're coming from that, you know, we have these different, um, for example, long term impact areas and high level outcomes we're trying to work towards. So for our vision, it's um, very much to do with the climate resilient Hindu Kush Himalaya and trying to look at um, disasters and take appropriate disaster reduction measures. And this is something that, you know, we might find something that works. We try and share it within the region. And also in terms of our long-term impact areas, one of the ones that we're really focusing on is the transboundary risk reduction. So unfortunately, um, the cryosphere doesn't often um, recognize the boundaries. In fact, it often marks them. So we could have a risk uh, related to cryosphere, especially permafrost, on one side of the boundary affecting people on the other. And also we have high level outcomes. And it was good to hear Stephen mention policy because we're not just here doing the research or sharing the research of the adaptation. We're trying to get our results into policy at a national level. And this is in the different countries, not just in one country. And our work then is divided into these strategic groups and action areas. And this is where the, um, the permafrost work is taking place in the top left corner here, managing cryosphere and water risks. So notice that it's really related to the risk as well, not just looking at permafrost because it's interesting, but because what is the risk from changes in permafrost and how does it affect people? And we just started this structure from the 1st of January. We're still getting used to it and trying to figure out what we're doing. We've been spending the past two months, you know, writing what we're going to do, who we're going to work with. And we're still really trying to figure it out. But we'll be doing a lot of the same kind of work we've done previously. And this is what we were doing was very much um, doing capacity building, for example. And this could be for university students. It could be for our partners in hydrometeorological organizations or disaster related organizations, and also trying to create cryos um, cryosphere and permafrost data ourselves and sharing it. And this is also a big problem in the region. And these are some of the activities we've done. So generally we've been working on glaciers, snow and permafrost. There's been quite a lot of work done on glaciers. 
a little bit on snow and also quite recently, and permafrost is actually very new for us, so not very much done so far. But it is very important in the Hindukush Himalaya. So this shows you that in the Northern Hemisphere, about 7% is in the, in the Hindukush Himalayan region, and we know very little about it. I know you're talking about knowledge gaps in Canada, but believe me, in the HKH, it's, it's all gap and very little knowledge, apart from the Tibetan plateau. And this is a, a graph that um, Stephen might recognize the format. So we, I took the inspiration from the IPCC and asked Prashant to look at this and just looking at the area of permafrost in different river basins and comparing with the glacier area, you'll notice the scales are different. And if you think about how much we know about, we know very little about glaciers, but if you think about how much area permafrost covers, we know even less about permafrost and it is a huge factor in the HKH. Um, this is one example, the World Bank, Bank's involved in a huge hydropower project in the Upper Aran River Basin, um, which was initially tried a few years ago, they're back doing it now, they're doing a huge amount of work looking at this. And initially, they just did not consider permafrost at all. So they looked at, you know, they know the climate's changing, the changes in runoff from glaciers and snow, but permafrost wasn't mentioned at all. So it's the new about gloves. Um, and that was in also some of the reports, but it was quite a while before they figured out we need to know about permafrost and we need to start looking at it. As part of Visimod's work, we organized a major cryosphere forum in 2021. It was supposed to take place in person in 2020. Um, obviously, we know how that went, but we decided we wanted to go ahead and do it anyway. So we did it online in 2021 and it was very successful. It brought together especially a lot of quite young researchers and a lot of young researchers in the HKH don't really get the opportunity to travel to international conferences. So having it online was actually very useful for them. And I know I saw a few familiar names who participated in it. And then we also followed that up in 2022 with a permafrost strategy meeting. And this was to really try and sort out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And um, we had a few people there who know a little bit about permafrost, like Pilfer Tabley. Um, we also had a lot of people there who don't know very much, but are keen on getting started. So we had participants from Pakistan, India, and Nepal in this workshop, and a few online from um, Bhutan and China, I think other places as well. And just really trying to, you know, how do you start doing something and formulating a strategy when so few people have experience in it? So this is one of the big challenges. And really trying to look at, you know, what are the major knowledge gaps we should be concerned about when there's, as I said, so much gaps. And looking at a strategy for monitoring permafrost in the region and just trying to get people to work together. And this is, as I said, a big challenge. And also what we want to do then is to get our work into policy. So we, yeah, we had about three days and came up with some different priorities. I'll not go into them, but um, I hope you can read them, just trying to, um, First of all, try and learn more about permafrost and then also educate your capacity building and talk to policymakers. Um, another thing we thought about is we have something in the HKH called the Up Into Space and Network. And it's a way of people communicating across the country boundaries and try and have a working group based on that. And we have a few things. This is um, some of the key messages from that workshop. And you can also see the, the URL here if you want to learn a little bit more about it. And we've also done training as well. And I didn't realize I had eight minutes, so I've got too many slides. I can't go into all of them, but I'll just say we're doing measurements in these three different areas in Nepal. Um, some of it, two of the sites are actually the same places where we have glacier measurements. So it's in Langtang and Mustang. And then also in Humla, and in Humla, as well as the other places, but especially in Humla, we're really trying to work with the local community for several reasons. First of all, if we put out a meteorological station and we discuss with the local community, it might be there when we come back, we hope so. We put one out in 2021 that disappeared totally in 2022. So this one we put out in 2022 on the left, we, it doesn't look like a great site you might think for a meteorological station, but it's secure and it might actually be there and measure something and we can get the data from it. Okay, so just, you know, interacting with local community and they're going to be the ones affected. So this is really important to us. And that was my last slide. So we're trying to learn more about permafrost, 
get it into policy and also to the local community. Thank you very much. Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Julia Boyke. I'm calling in from Potsdam, Germany. And um, together with my co-authors, I don't know if any is online, so there's Sarah in Exeter. Exeter. She is a Earth system modeler. There's Julia Martin. She's a snow expert. Norbert is a data expert. And Simon is a uh, remote sensing expert. And we got together a couple of years ago and as a very diverse research community and thought, OK, we need something how to standardize our measurements. And this is what came up with it. This is the protocol and also paper you see on the right here. This is the protocol about how to measure permafrost thaw as well as uh, associated parameters such as snow, water, permafrost thaw, vegetation height and soil. And um, I'm not going to go to detail. Okay, so the objective is to better monitor and understand permafrost thaw with a um, uh, background that we have very heterogeneous and uh, thaw rates that vary on multiple scales and that we need to better understand this. So better understand and monitor permafrost thaw. We would like to establish a baseline of data from around the permafrost region and also the data can be used for evalu evaluation of remote sensing data. For example, snow depth or also vegetation height. And then in, in the last um, the last goal is the evaluation of global scale models and I will show you an example later. <clears throat> Okay, here's the, um, the, the uh, how do you call it? Like you can scan it and you have the protocol as well as the paper and everything. Um, the, you can download the app from um, the Android or the iOS store. So this is what we developed as part of the protocol, not only the protocol, but also this app. And we also have online these various videos that can show you how you should trans uh, set up your transact or you uh, do your thought apps. So the videos are very simple and they should be uh, like um, understandable for everybody. We also provide with the app a way of a slow, uh, an aid and help function. <laughs> Uh, for example, if you're not a vegetation expert, you can yeah, call up the help function on your app and you can see here how you start and then you are just looped through um, and it's actually quite simple. Um, and um, we tested this app now several times and here you see a picture of us in the field last year actually in West Greenland where you see Simon here with critical phase. She actually wrote the protocol for the vegetation and you see here we are exercising with it and it had some bugs and here's um, uh, the student, Janika, who's also helping with, uh, she's our critical thinker. So we went in the field again through this app and the app has had several updates so far. Okay, so the data are transferred directly from the app to an online database. And I've made a screenshot here of the database. This was the status, I think, just um, two weeks ago or so. So these are all the sites that are currently um, um, recording. And I think I might not have the time to show you this uh, online. So I'm going to go through it and maybe at the end. So this is um, how the sites are visualized on the web page. You have the um, the various sites and then you have the metadata in here as well as access to all the data and if there's time I will show you at the end how it works. So in 21 we started the measurements, 22 we had some interact size sites um, uh, contributing data but most of the sites are actually started by talking to researchers individually. And then we use the data now for a project that is uh, led by Annette Barge. It's called EO4PAC, Earth Observation for Pumperfrost Dominated Arctic Holes. And we just had yesterday a midterm um, uh, for, uh, a review meeting. And uh, for this project, we're using the data that we're collecting in 2020. One, Circum Arctic at all these um, Circum Arctic sites. So we had like 900 thaw depth measurements for the site, and we also have snow depth, water level, uh, soil properties, and vegetation. But for the evaluation, we only looked at thaw depths now. And also, currently, we are um, working on a data set to so clean up the data set, submit it to Pangea, where everybody is co author who contributed to the data. And here's just a snapshot of the results. So this shows you a comparison of the team mosaic thaw depth data for 2021 with other data that are in the radius. Here is an example of Svalbard, where we have two team mosaic stations and then the ones from uh, here from Unis and further away. So um, this shows you the comparison of thaw depth between different sites. Uh, 
in the close vicinity, but also it with a radius up to 120 meters, uh, 20 kilometers away. And of course, you can see that there's a difference as expected. But um, yeah, also what we did is we used the data for um, modeling comparison. So this was done with CryoGrid, where the thaw depth was um, estimated. And uh, what you can see also as an example of Svalbard, that we that the model very much underestimates the thaw depth um, for these sites. And what you can also see is that the thaw depth is very much, um, um, sorry, what I want to say is that the thaw depth even between the two sites that are close by, these are, you can see it's a kilometer radius, it's very, it's very large. So the spatial uh, difference between close sites is much larger than uh, even sometimes between in larger regions. The good agreement we found between the sites that are located very high up north in the Arctic tundra, like in Siberia, Samolov, and Chulik Lake, um, these are the these were the best sites, best agreements with the model data. And um, but again, the message here is that we have a large variability between um, <clears throat> sorry between sites that are very close by. For example, Zuckenberg. Wet and Zuckenberg dry has a much larger variability as well as the sites here on Svalbard, which are within one kilometer away. Okay, so the message here again written out is that the seasonal evolution of the thaw depth and the small scale spatial variability is not captured by the model data. The model is just underestimating the thaw depth. And, um, but the data are very much suitable for, for this um, validation for models. and. For example, also the data that I'm showing here below. This is, uh, for example, screen. Uh, these are the images that are also transferred with the app. You could see this is not only give you a good baseline of the setup of the site, also the characteristics, but also vegetation height and even like soil profiles. I don't have a picture here, but you can estimate, for example, soil texture with it. Okay, so lessons learned. Um, the working on the app was quite uh, challenging. And still, we have to clean up a lot of data. For example, one of the issues was the incorrect data entries that need manual correction. And I mean, we are all geoscientists, but I, I would say like every third person put the wrong coordinates in there, which meant that all the Canadian sites ended up being in Siberia because of the uh, minus <laughs> sign. And um, then the sites that we started are often started because of personal connection and enthusiastic field data collecting people. But my question would be, how do I get others to, to do this, especially also for if we do larger scale um, data, data collection? So, but first we would like to um, develop a reviewer for more data visualization and download. And also the idea of a global day where we do like everybody will collect at their sites the team mosaic data and puts them into the app and then we have them online right away so this would be a great snapshot for for the future but so this is the question to you now to this auditorium so what would it need for you to start a team mosaic transect at your site so the site can be like five meters long or the transect it can be 500 meters long it would take in bet between from five to minutes to 50 minutes but what would it mean if I cannot give you money or pay for this? And this is also a question to the communities because we would love to have um, the communities benefiting from this somehow, but I have really no experience with this. So any, any ideas or suggestions for this uh, are highly welcome. See, so here's the web page, and um, this is just the protocol where you can download it or the paper and information about us, but most of interesting is the data collection tool that we have. So here are the participating stations and you see images and you see there's always the metadata here with the station. Um, and the one that should really get the, the golden prize for everything. So this is the current station um, active, active if we have a wide range. But this is really like the, I show you the one which is should get the, the prize. This is the Tulik station because yeah, they supply not only thaw depth, but also vegetation, snow, and so on, and that very regularly, including so, uh, not only data, but also images. Julia, there is a question mm -hmm. specifically for you in the chat. It's from okay. Julia Ortet. It says, how much do you explore the agreement between in situ and remote sensing data? If applicable, what kind of remote sensing data are you using? 
so what we just did is the um, with as part of the EO4 pack, we did the um, model temperatures, uh, sorry, the model thaw depth using the CCI data set. So model thaw depth, but this is from based on remote sensing data that you used in the model. Uh, we have not explored yet the vegetation height, for example, and remote sensing. This is still a plan that we have, but of course we also need money for this or somebody who works on it. We also have a question from Raja. It says permafrost thaw. Now that is, I mean, you're all talking about permafrost thaw, but are you specifically talking to Julia? It, I'm not sure. It says a recent study found the mercury content in permafrost regions. Is there any possibility of mixing this mercury content in glacier fed rivers if the permafrost thaws? Why don't we bring up Isabel and Miriam in case any questions come up and yeah, maybe related to what you, the key questions you mentioned, Michelle, in the beginning, maybe it would also be worth to show them again. So you mentioned that there is, uh, you could do a better job in bringing the different partners uh, on the international level, but also on the national levels um, together. So that's why I also posed the question at the end of my presentation, how, how can we do this? Is, uh, is it still feasible to have these conferences every two or four years that we build this have this platform to meet or are there other the other ideas uh, from the community thanks isabel miriam did you have anything that you wanted to share before we move on to the next set of speakers um i think i, I just really want to say that if anybody has plans to do some work in the hkh are you already working with groups and you know please get in touch with us they also just found out that Michelle, for example, worked at ISIMOD before, or worked with ISIMOD. So we really encourage this kind of collaboration. We really need it. And also, especially in terms of capacity building, that we're trying to run fairly regular um, courses on <clears throat> permafrost, as well as other things related to cryosphere. And these are open for students in the region. So we also often have external speakers, for example, either in person or online. So if people have ideas for collaboration or time or especially money and ideas for projects, then please get in touch with us. I think that's the main thing, uh, my take home message. Thank you.